That is such a good song. It is such an amazing song. I especially uh, appreciate that third verse. Let the treasures of the trial form within me as I go. At the end of this long passage, let me leave them at your throne. And the only way that's going to happen is we is if we view those trials from heaven's perspective and, and keep this, this life in view as simply a journey on the way to being with God, being with our Lord and Savior forever in heaven. And when we think of it that way, this is a journey. We're in a foreign country, as Hebrews 11 shows us, passing through, then we can better put those trials in perspective of stepping stones for growth. And uh, see the trials not on a horizontal plane is simply painful, but on a heavenly plane is uh, helping us to be the kind of people God wants us to be. Uh, that, that third verse is really powerful. That the treasures of the trial. And uh, again, the only way we can see it that way is if uh, we view it from God's perspective. Well, we're in Matthew 26. Thank you for being in the study with us tonight. We're going to focus, first of all, on the memorial instituted by Jesus in Matthew 26, verse 26 and 27, and um, then look at uh, his statement about covenant in verse 28. But uh, first of all, let's, let's look at this memorial. And uh, I had a note here. I wanted to, to bring this out also, a correction that the story of Martha anointing Jesus with spikenard is in three Gospels, not in four. It's in three Gospels. And uh, it is in Matthew, Mark, and John, but not in Luke. I needed to make that correction. Look with me now at Matthew 26 and uh, verse 26. During the last Passover observed by Jesus, while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. From the Bible, from what we see revealed in the Gospels, what four items do we know for certain were on the table? And you know from Exodus 12, that definitely this item was there, but what other items from what's said here and, and in the Gospels do we know were on the table at that time? Okay, we know there was bread, and we're going to look at Bible passages that prove that this was unleavened. This is not just a personal preference, but it was from the Bible, we know, uh, truly unleavened bread. Okay, so unleavened bread, what other three items for sure were on the table? Um, something uh, Jeff and I talked about last night, there's motors running all the time in this auditorium. It's a noisy auditorium. And so just keep that in mind. Uh, when you make a comment, faith comes by hearing. You have important things to say, as important and as valuable as what I have to say. We want to hear them. So when you make a comment, um, let us hear it, brother and sister. So just keep that in mind, especially because of a noisy auditorium that we have. So what else is here? Okay. Thank you, sister. Fruit of the vine, and it specifically says fruit of the vine. And so since, since Jesus didn't specify fermented or unfermented, I think it's wise to go with unfermented for a number of reasons. We can, we've gotten into it on other occasions. Yes, brother. Okay. Appreciate that comment. That's right. There's some fermentation 
in fermented wine. And so, good comment. Um, third, what's the third item? Did you say, did you say the, the brick? Okay, okay. Yeah, that's right. So there was a container that held this, but is, and, and there was also a bowl holding something else, but is that important or is what's in it important? And, and we'll look at that in just a moment. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Angel. And we'll look at that in just a moment. And then we know there was SOP, which, you know, different ideas. It had to be what flavor, we know this. Different ideas what was in it, but it had to be what flavor. Yes, ma'am, it had to be bitter. Juice, uh, we'll say a mixture of fruits plus vinegar, something like that. And, and many suggest to look like clay or brick to remind them of the affliction they had in Egypt. And in particular, you know, making all that brick and building all these things for the Pharaoh. Uh, bitter sop. Okay. No, you're, you're on it, Mary. Uh, and that would tie in here, sister. Mary reminded us very importantly that uh, all of this uh, initially uh, was done because they had to leave Egypt in haste. They were to be dressed, fully ready, staff in hand. When Moses gave the command, they were to depart Egypt. And so one of the reasons they were to have unleavened bread is, uh, you know, you're not going to give time for that bread to rise. And so it's, it's part of the leaving in haste. Um, but it's called the bread of affliction because it's an unpleasant, unsavory bread. And it also was to remind them of their unsavory uh, and uh, afflicted experiences in Egypt. Both. Okay, thanks, Mary. So, SOP, and what other obvious thing was there? Exodus 12. You had your lamb, you had your meat. So, we know those things. Now, Jesus is going to take two of these elements and give them new spiritual significance in his new covenant kingdom. And of course, of course those are the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. Now, concerning the unleavened bread, because you know, we've never specifically studied this together before. Uh, I know you know it, but we need to know what passages teach this so that we can give a reason, an answer of the hope that's within us and why we do what we do, say what we say, and don't say or do certain things. Look with me at Exodus 12, Exodus 12. So here is the uh, first great feast of the Jews. They had three great feasts in the year. This is the first of the three. And uh, in verse three, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying on the 10th of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Verse five, your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. For seven, moreover, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. Verse eight, they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire. And here we have it, brothers and sisters. They shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So we know from statements like this that the only bread in the house of an Israelite during this time was unleavened bread. 
okay? Because that's what God commanded. And then verse 23, uh, what's going to happen, verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and for your children forever. And then look with me at Deuteronomy 16, please. Deuteronomy 16. There was a uh, feast that joined with the Passover, and Passover and this feast, Feast of Unleavened Bread, are used interchangeably because one ran right into the other. Verse, chapter 16, verse 3, you shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with it unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste so that you may remember all the days of your life, the days when you came out of the land, the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. There's no question that the bread they had on that table was unleavened bread. And therefore, when Jesus took bread and he distributed it and said, take, eat, this is my body, that's the bread that was on the table. Uh, and that's the kind of bread that uh, was being used. So he took bread and uh, after a blessing, the Greek word is Eucharist. You, you hear some ch churches and they'll talk about the Holy Eucharist. Well, all that means is giving of thanks. So they're characterizing this whole thing as the giving of thanks, uh, which I think it's much more than that. But Jesus gave thanks. Before he ate a meal, before Paul had a meal, they always gave thanks. Many things may be said, of course, here uh, at the table as we remember our Lord and Savior. But if a brother does nothing more than give thanks, is that okay? Absolutely. It says Jesus gave thanks. I think it's appropriate uh, to say a number of things surrounding his death and suffering, but the primary purpose is to give thanks. Uh, he said, this is my body. Okay, now let's, let's think about that. This is my body. Look at the strength of that statement. There are people, there are churches that will take a statement like that and say he means his literal body, his literal flesh, right? Uh, what kind of figure is this? What kind of figure is Jesus using, which is common in Scripture? What, what figure of speech is it? It's not a simile. Simile is like or as. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. That's a simile. It is an analogy. That's, that's for certain, brother. Um, we, it, it, this is a one-word direct statement parallel. This is a, a situation where it's a metaphor. It's a phrase or a word uh, which is substituted for another word or phrase. Direct statement parallel. Now, Think of other places. It's common. Jesus used them commonly. You see them in scriptures commonly. Other places where Jesus used a metaphor to portray himself. Last. I am what? Okay. I'm the, I'm the way, truth, and life. Good. John 14, 6. Good, sister. I am the vine, John 15. I am the vine. You are the branches. We're not literal branches, but we're like branches and that the branch is dependent on the vine, which is dependent on the ground, which is our father. Good. Uh, so I am the door, John 10. We got three. I am the bread. Very good, brother. Uh, John 6. I am the bread of life. It comes down out of heaven. Uh, so also from John 10, I am the good shepherd. And on and on you could go. This is not unusual. Jesus, on one occasion, rebuking Herod Antipas, said, go tell that fox, that 
crafty, deceitful fellow. Go tell that fox. Uh, so he used it in referring to other people as well. So it's not unusual. And, and, and so when we get to Matthew 26, and he says, this is my body, uh, as we've gone through Matthew, one of the other gospels, we're not surprised at that. You know, we're not confused as to what's going on here. Uh, this is a figure of speech. Uh, how do we know also, in addition to this being a common way of speaking and, and teaching, how do we also know that it's not literal flesh and it's not literal blood when he says, this is my blood? How do we know? What are some other ways? What was the law? What does it teach on the subject of blood? It's, it's be a violation of the command of the Lord in Leviticus 17. Um, 11 through 14 there, 17, 11 through 14, to eat blood. Should not eat flesh with its blood. It'd be a violation of a clear command if they eat literal blood. What else? Jesus saying, this is my body. Now he's, sitting, he's there reclining with them, leaning on his elbow, reclining with them, saying, this is my body. And they're looking at him and he looks pretty whole to them. His whole body is there, all the blood running through his arteries and veins. He couldn't mean this is literal flesh or literal blood. Violation of the law and common sense would tell you there's no way he's meaning literal blood and literal flesh. Well, um, Let's, let's, uh, why we're saying a lot about that is, of course, our purposes and what the Lord would have us to do to think about. But there are religions that a doctrine known as transubstantiation. You're going to run into this. I'm sure you probably already have. To some degree, it means a change in substance. A change in substance. Uh, the Catholic religion teaches transubstantiation, and they teach that the bread becomes the literal flesh of Jesus, and the fruit of the vine becomes the literal blood of Jesus. Can't see it, can't smell it, can't taste it, but it is in a mystical way. In a mystical way, the body and the blood of Jesus. And so the doctrine transubstantiation, and they base the doctrine, you know, on statements like this, which we've shown are simply metaphors. And on another passage, we'll look at in a moment in John 6, where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you have no part in me. And so they, you know, just rip that passage out of context. So uh, that's, that's the doctrine. And uh, it, it's very, very um, convenient in that it suits, it suits also a, um, a religious rite that they have. They believe that the Lord's Supper is a sacrament. A sacrament, and they have many sacraments, but a sacrament is a religious rite in which if you simply observe it, there's grace that is supplied to you by the observance of that rite. And so here's a line of, you know, faithful parishioners, and, and here is the priest and he takes bread and he dips it in wine. In some cases, they'll do both, but my experience is he'll dip it in wine and then he'll put that in the mouth of the parishioner as he passes through. I don't know what they did during COVID, but as a rule, that's what, what you did. And so when the person does that, then uh, he receives grace. It is a sacrament. And so it, 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 it really suits their purpose well. You need us to get that grace. You've got to have us. You've got to have the church. You've got to have this sacrament. And we're the only ones that can give it to you. It really suits their purpose very conveniently. Yes, brother. Amen. That's right. Every time the person partakes of the 
Yeah, that's a good, good point to bring out. The mass is the doctrine that the sacrifice of Jesus gets carried out every single week in the sacrament of the bread and fruit of the vine. So Jesus undergoes that sacrifice every week. The Bible teaches uh, he died once for all, once for all mankind, all time. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And one priest, one high priest. And he's a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, as opposed to the many, many priests uh, under the order of Aaron, as commanded by God. So excellent uh, to bring that out as well. So it, there, there's a number of levels in which this doctrine is wrong. It is false doctrine. Uh, the bread and fruit of the vine were given as a memorial to remember Jesus, representing, emblematic of his suffering in the body, his blood, his precious blood that shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And so we're to use it in that way. The grace or the blessing is in the reverent remembrance of Jesus. Being in covenant relationship, the reverent remembrance of him and his suffering and death. We proclaim his death until he comes again. There's the grace. The, uh, I won't put it on the board, but there's, there's other religions that have a doctrine known as consubstantiation, which is with uh, the bread and fruit of the vine are mixed with the body and the blood of Jesus. So it's very, very similar, actually, in its uh, thinking. But again, it's the idea of a repeated sacrifice of Jesus in the mass. That's, that is totally false. Um, okay, any, any questions on that? Let's go to John 6, and if you have a question, just go ahead and shout it out as we're turning over there, John 6, and we won't spend a lot of time here, but I just want to make this main point uh, from John 6, because uh, me and another brother, uh, we studied with someone, we've, we studied this with a number of people in the Catholic religion, our friends who who believe in God, believe the Bible's word of God, Jesus, son of God, but they're wrong about this, but they're wrong about this. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the things that they believe is from this chapter, and I'm going to show you why their ideas are not right based on this chapter. In John chapter 6, um, Jesus had just fed the 5,000 the day before, and so he says to them, in uh, verse 26, let's start in verse 26. He said uh, to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So Jesus says to the Jews, this large, large group of Jews that had been following him, that your interests are not spiritual, they're carnal, they're physical in nature. I'm, I'm not about that. I'm about the spiritual and my kingdom is spiritual. It is not of this world. You need to think spiritually. Verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so here's, here's faith spoken of by Jesus as a work of God. In other words, not a work of merit, but a condition of salvation. And those are two very different things, a work of merit and a condition of salvation, uh, as well as repentance and baptism and so on. So verse 30, they said to him, what, the, what then shall we do, or what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? He's already fed 5,000 the day before. You, know, you need more? Um, that, that's casting 
doubt on the legitimacy of what he's already done. Uh, verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Seems to me at this point, they're asking for more free bread, just as Israel received manna from heaven. Again, carnal, physical. And Jesus said in verse 32, truly I say to you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. That being Jesus and eternal life. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, Lord, always give us this bread. Well, then verse 35, Jesus said, here it is. I am that bread. I am the bread of life. Now look at the statement. My Bible, I've got it highlighted because it, it connects with what we're going to see in a moment. He who comes to me will not hunger. So if you eat of Jesus, if you feast on Jesus, then what will be the result of that? You'll be, be filled with grace. So I, I want you to see that feasting on Jesus is equivalent to coming to him. See that? You come to me, that's equivalent to feasting on me. I'm the bread. You need to feed on me. I'm the bread, feed on me. And he who believes in me will never thirst. So if you drink of me, then I will fill you again with the grace of salvation. That is equivalent to believing in me. Believing in Jesus, coming to Jesus, is the equivalent of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's what I want you to see from the verbal neighborhood. And so when we get over here to verse 53, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. For he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is not about the Lord's Supper. And even I, I, I've known a brethren to use it that way. It's not about the Lord's Supper. Now, there may be a way you could tie it in. But that's not his purpose. Its purpose is to simply say, Jesus is the only way. And unless we feast on what he has to offer, him, his message, his hope, faith in him in every way, and lay it all down at his feet, then we, we don't have hope. And so believing in him is drinking of him, coming to him is feeding on his flesh. That's context. Now, the, the, again, the Catholic Church will say verse 53 is why we teach what we teach. Way out of context. That's resting the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Those who understand the thinking of life of Jesus into their lives, yeah. they never function. Not in that sense. They have that sense of life. They have a perfect Yeah. It is a complete submission to Jesus, and it is to be for life. And Jesus says, those who come to me, yielding their lives to me, their heart and lives to me, I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. That's wonderful, wonderful hope. Okay, um, anybody question on that? I just wanted to, our Catholic friends, that's a heavy duty doctrine. It's something that comes out inevitably and uh, something that does need to be understood. And, and again, some brethren even have used John 6 in, a, in that way. And that's not the way Jesus is teaching here. There may be a way to use it, you know, yeah, you come to Jesus and think of it as his suffering, certainly, but uh, primarily it's just submitting to him, believing and obeying him. Um, okay, uh, 
let's go ahead and uh, the cup, verse 27. Verse 27, let's go back to Matthew 26, please. Matthew 26 and verse 27, he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. A cup, drink from it, all of you. Uh, so you're talking about the container or the contents? What's important here? It's contents. It's the contents. And so when he says he took a cup, is he, he's talking about what's in the cup. What's in the cup. Now, this is another figure of speech. And we call this figure of speech metonymy. And again, it's common in Scripture. This, there are many places statements like this when um, you have a passage where it says uh, the Ethiopian was reading Isaiah that's actually a metonymy and we know what he means when Luke says that about the Ethiopian he's reading a passage of scripture written by Isaiah he's not reading the word Isaiah all over the page he may, may not see the word Isaiah at all in there, but he's reading what came from Isaiah. But because of a close relationship between Isaiah and the writings of Isaiah, we say he's reading Isaiah. I'm reading 2 Timothy. We know we're talking about the writings that are in 2 Timothy. The simple thing would be like, the mayor spoke to the city. You think he spoke to the city? You think he spoke to a bunch of buildings? That's, that's metonymy. And we use statements like that all the time. He didn't speak to a bunch of buildings. He spoke to the people who live in the city. But because of a close relationship between the city where they live and the people, then we, we simply say he spoke to the city. Uh, Jesus said to Saul on the road to Damascus, he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Who is Paul actually persecuting? His people. His people. But because there's such a close relationship between Jesus and his people, you're persecuting me and, and doing what you're doing. And so when he talks about the cup, because of the relationship that exists between the cup and the contents, you can just say the cup. I have a cup of that, a cup of this. And we mean, I don't care about the container. It's going to taste the same whether it's in paper or wood. I don't care. You know, just give me tea or uh, lemonade or whatever. But give me a cup of that. And we mean the contents, of course. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing here. It's the contents uh, that, that matter. Does anybody have a, any questions or a problem with that at all? Uh, it, it, you, you're aware that there are a number of uh, brethren years ago, it's not much of an issue anymore, but they would debate this publicly, that there were actually, that the, the emphasis of Jesus here was as much on the container as it was the contents. And there used to be a number of churches where that was the belief. And you had to all drink from the same container. That'd be a problem, wouldn't it? On many levels, it'd be a problem. You'd always want to sit in front, you know, but then they may trick you and start in the back, you know, but the container is not important. It's remembering Jesus, and since he specified the element as fruit of the vine, then I'm not willing to use any other element. Uh, as far as the elements are concerned, there are groups that use different elements. The, uh, the Mormons use water. And they use water. Now, they observe the Lord's Supper every week, but they use water. They, they acknowledge that Jesus commanded fruit of the vine, but Joseph Smith, in one of the writings known as Doctrine and Covenants, their claimed inspired writing said, it doesn't matter. So they listened to Joseph Smith. 
and not to Jesus, the prophet. Joseph Smith is a false prophet. And that's just one of the areas. He was totally false and went directly against Jesus. Um, Yeah, amen. It's a good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not who's right. It's what's right. What's right. And that, that's, that's God's word. Speak only as the writings, oracles of God. Yeah. Yeah. Paul, Paul said, if we or an angel from heaven teach any other gospel than that which has been preached, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. Right. And, and, the, and because of that, brother, that's why you have divisions. A denomination is a division. You have denominations of money, of divisions of money, fives, tens, twenties, and so on, different amounts. But because there are men who propose different doctrines, that creates division. Because those who love the Word of God, who, who are searching the scriptures like the noble Bereans, They'll say, you know, you may mean well, but I don't see that anywhere in here. I can't have fellowship in that. I can't go along with that. And so if the person just keeps insisting, though, that we believe this or do that, that's a problem. Uh, especially if it forces me into a position where I have to be involved in it. That's a problem, Houston. And so I have to say, no, I can't do that. See how it creates divisions. Doctrines of men create divisions. And yeah. 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 There, I, I want to say this as a qualifier, uh, brother and class, and that is there are areas where we can disagree without being disagreeable. Romans 14 and 15 says that very clearly. You know, where it is just a matter of opinion, uh, scruple, something not clearly revealed in the Word of God. For example, yes, study how much, how often. Well, that's up to you and me. Uh, pray, how many times, how often? That's up to you and I. You know, there are areas where we can disagree without being disagreeable. And uh, we, we need to keep that in mind too. But these are doctrinal things that Jesus specifically said fruit of the vine. He said bread, and we know that it was unleavened bread. But yes, Mary? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it, it definitely will involve interpretation. Everything has to be interpreted. Um, however, it, it primarily involves to what degree do you accept this as a measure of all that we believe and do? To what degree? And it, it primarily comes down to that. It, is this really your measure? And so in a class, that's always where I begin is we need the same measure because we don't have the same measure and, the, and, and respect for the same measure. We're not going to get anywhere. We talk about this, and any number of things all day long, but we've got to have the same, we have to have a respect for the same measure. We can always grow in our respect for the measure. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah. If, if you're forcing someone to do something they don't believe in, I can't have fellowship. If you're forcing that issue, then I, I can't have fellowship in that. If it's, a, it's, you know, if it's other things could involve, you know, not forcing you to believe in that. For example, your study, your prayers, things like that. But Mary, in class, there are hundreds of things in which we may disagree without being disagreeable if there are things not clearly revealed in the Word of God, as Romans 14 and 15 teaches. Paul says a lot about that, but these are not among them because he specifies bread, fruit of the vine. But that, that needs to be borne in mind. There are many areas we can disagree without being disagreeable. We went through COVID. There were many disagreements during COVID, mask or unmask, vaccination, unvaccination. We, we all have different opinions, and it's, it's your opinion. You're welcome to it. And there's plenty of room for that. Uh, what COVID unfortunately brought out is some attitudes. I think they're already there, and it just manifested themselves. This gave an opportunity for those attitudes to be manifested. They were already there. It didn't cause it, but it caused certain attitudes to be manifested that shouldn't have been there. And that's all over the world, not just here and Columbia or other places, it's all over the world. Um, we're out of time. Well, Lord willing, we will uh, we'll begin in uh, Matthew 26 and verse 28, the idea of covenant, the idea of covenant. We're taking more time on this because we've never studied the subject of the Lord's Supper like this specifically, so I want to take a little more time with it. I would welcome, as you offer tonight, your comments, any questions. So we'll look forward to our study next week. Thank you for being a part of class tonight. God bless you.